On behalf of the Board of Directors, the Academy staff, it is my honor to welcome you to New Orleans and the 44th Annual Meeting and Scientific Symposium. In keeping with the Academy tradition, please rise and join me in the National Anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free and the Thank you. We are pleased to have you join us in New Orleans, a city with rich cultural history, including amazing architecture, incredible food, and an iconic music scene. We hope that you are able to enjoy this city and all that it has to offer during your time here. But before we move on, I think we need a little celebration. The enormous legislative win that we had, which ensures our ONP clinical notes are now recognized by CMS as part of the patient medical record. Congratulations. We did it. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it was a huge effort over many years. Um, and it was a direct result of the collaboration of the members of the ONP Alliance as well as the Amputee Coalition. So again, thank you. Way to go. We have an outstanding meeting for you planned, uh, which includes a keynote speaker, Randy Gravett. But before we welcome Grant Randy, the Academy would like to recognize a few people. Our exhibits chair and clinical content committee have been hard at work since last May creating this amazing educational and networking event. I ask each of the members to stand as I call their names. Exhibits chair, Jeff Kingsley. Chair of the clinical content committee, Mark Halokla. Clinical content committee members, Stefania Fatone, Shane Werdeman, Kinsey Heron, Sally DeBello, Brian Kalis, and Russ Warren Fisher. Way to go. The Academy thanks you for your hard work and dedication. The Academy Board of Directors would also like to recognize the contributions of our past presidents. I would like the Academy past presidents to please stand. Right. Rise up, guys. Way to go. Your leadership over the years has allowed the Academy to continually work to improve the profession and the lives of those individuals that we serve. Way to go. I would like to also ask the current and past president of AOPA, ABC, NAAOP, NCOP, BOC, and the Amputee Coalition to please stand. Come on, guys.
Your contributions and the contributions of your organizations have made our profession stronger and more resilient, and this past week is evidence of that. Way to go. I would like now to ask all of the students and residents to please stand. Come on, guys. Yes, yes. Okay. Great. You are the future of this profession. Your creative ideas and insights will light the way as our profession moves forward. I now have the honor of introducing my board colleagues. We continue to work hard to serve you and our academy. Board members, please stand as I call your name. Immediate past president, Rick Miller. President-elect, Lee Davis. Vice president, Kate Allen. Treasurer, Jared Howell. <laughs> Directors, Joanne Canis, Susan Kapp, Jerry Stark, Sarah Thomas, and Shane Werdeman. Thank you. There is not enough time in this opening session to share with you all that the Academy's volunteers have accomplished this past year. So I hope that you will join us on Friday at the membership breakfast and business meeting. Over the course of the next few days, you will have the opportunity to earn more than 40 credits by participating in a variety of educational options that will give you skills and insights to improve your practice on day one. So next Monday, you're going home with some really great stuff. The Academy app is your key to this meeting. Make sure that you have it downloaded for up-to-the-minute information so that you can share your knowledge, be inspired, and reconnect with friends and colleagues. <laughs> History does not and cannot predict the future, but it lays the foundation for the future. And what we do today in ONP will lay the foundation for our future as a profession. If you would have told me 20 years ago when I stood on a stage quite similar to this one, and gave my first Academy presentation that I would be standing here today welcoming you all, I'm not sure I would have believed you. And if you would have told me 30 years ago, when I began working as a technician between undergrad and ONP school, that there would be a national commission on orthotic and prosthetic education, and that commission would usher our field to an entry-level master's degree, I'm not sure I would have believed you. And if you would have told me that our profession would have lobbyists and an alliance made up of all the ONP sister organizations collaborating and working together for the greater good of our profession and the patients we serve, I'm not sure I would have even thought that possible. But I stand here today welcoming you because of the foundation that was laid 48 years ago. The Academy was formed in 1970 by a few people with a vision of creating a professional home for the individual practitioner. They recognized that this profession was growing and the individual practitioner needed a place to exchange ideas and build on the foundational knowledge developed by others. Because of their vision, we're here today, all coming together to share our ideas and our knowledge, and in the process, crafting a foundation for our future of, of ONP. But vision in the absence of mentorship and stewardship is nothing more than an unrealized dream. In 1974, the Academy held its inaugural meeting and changed the way individual practitioners saw their place in the profession. The meeting brought together different viewpoints and ideas, and practitioners were enlightened and challenged to think in new ways. That same year, my dad helped change the way I viewed the world. To give you a bit of context, my dad was the only child of very young parents. He slept on an army cot his entire childhood, not because his family was poor, but because they had other things to do with their money. He slept on that cot, putting it up and taking it down every day. 
until he graduated from high school. He left home soon after he graduated because he had a vision of a better life for himself and the family that he would eventually have. He joined the Air Force and went on to college, first graduating with his baccalaureate degree and later his MBA. He was hired at a large corporation as an ad man, where in order to effectively reach the people with his ads, he had to learn and understand why people do what they do. The same year as the Academy's first meeting, my dad had gone through training to better understand the people he was creating those ads for. And he was really excited about what he learned. So much so that he got it in his head that his 10-year-old daughter needed to see the videos that his team had just watched. I had never been to my dad's office. We lived in the suburbs, and there was really no reason why I would ever need to go there. But I remember my dad that morning looking over at me and asking if I'd like to go to the office with him because he had something to share with me. Long story short, we get to his office and he sits me down and shows me the Morris Massey video, what you are now is where you were when. The gist of the message is who you become in this world is formed by the influences you've had throughout your life. Influences like school, like residency, like those first years in the profession. Many of us can recall a moment when we've experienced a seismic shift in our thinking. That day with my dad changed my thinking because part of what he was sharing with me was the idea that certain pivotal moments in his life made him the person that he was and we all have the potential to provide those moments to others. One of my most memorable such experiences in OMP occurred about 20 years ago. I had the bright idea of asking one of my very first residents, so, what did you think of the last year? How did it go? I can tell you, be careful what you ask for. She provided me with a two-page, typewritten, single-spaced, and I'm pretty sure, 10-point font letter outlining all of the things we could do better. That letter stung our residency program. We thought that we were doing a pretty good job, but she was right. We did need to do better, and there were opportunities that we had missed. And in that moment, the mentors became the mentees. This week's annual meeting will likely provide many pivotal moments and opportunities. Those of you in the audience today will have an opportunity to impact the future of our profession. The support you give by listening to the lectures over the next few days, asking questions of presenters, will help generate the questions to be answered by our researchers and clinicians of the future. This job we have, it's a lifetime journey. Opportunities are continually presenting themselves in the form of new patients, innovative questions to research, and colleagues to collaborate with. There are always mountains to climb because when you reach the top of one, you've given yourself a new horizon, a new perspective, and you can see farther. Someone once said to me at the beginning of my career, our finest hour is yet to come, and 30 years later, it's still true. The things you do for yourself are gone when you are gone, but the things you do for others remain as your legacy. What will your legacy be? Thank you. I now have the privilege to recognize two outstanding academicians for their service to the ONP profession. Lee Davis, our president-elect, will assist with the honors. Thank you, Alicia. I stand here as a representative of our Academy to present the Academy's Distinguished Practitioner Award to Keith Smith, CO, LO, Fellow. This award recognizes Keith's leadership and dedication to the OMP profession. After earning his bachelor's degree in chemistry from St. Louis University, Keith pursued his training in orthotics and prosthetics 
from the Northwestern University OMP program in 1996. For more than 20 years, he has worked for Orthotics and Prosthetics Lab in St. Louis. In addition to maintaining his busy clinical practice, Keith has been extremely active in research, teaching, and with the Academy. He participated in the first State of the Science Conference on orthotic treatment of idiopathic scoliosis in Sherman's kyphosis. He has authored numerous peer-reviewed scientific publications, trained a generation of residents, and has lectured nationally and abroad for the Academy, AOPA, ACPOC, the American Academy for Cerebral Palsy and Developmental Medicine, and the British Association of Prosthetists and Orthotists. Keith is also a guest lecturer at Maryville and Washington Universities in St. Louis. He serves as clinical advisor for Ultraflex Systems, is a member of the Speakers Bureau for Cascade DAFO, and designed the Apello TLSO for Adolescent Idiopathic Scoliosis with Atlantic Rim Brace Manufacturing Corporation. His honors include the 2004 Academy Trainheart Award and the 2013 Academy Clinical Creativity Award. Keith received the 2014 De Novo Keynote Speaker Award from the British Association of Prosthetists and Orthotists. He served as a member of the Academy Board of Directors for six years, serving as president in 2009 to 2010. Keith's clinical passion is the orthotic management of children with neuromuscular disorders. He participates in multidisciplinary clinics for patients with cerebral palsy, spina bifida, Rett syndrome, scoliosis, movement disorders, and selective dorsal rhizotomy. Keith is also an accomplished amateur magician, always ready with a trick to delight and relax his young patients. New camp for kids with cerebral palsy, and today the campers had a very special visit. A magician stopped by the three-day winter camp to perform. Usually when these kids see Keith Smith, they are seeing him as patients. The magician's day job is fitting kids with CP with braces to help them walk. And he doesn't just do shows, he also uses his magic to put the kids at ease when they visit his office. I think sometimes I get more out of the show than, than even the kids because, you know, I walk away with a lot of the excitement that, that I draw off of the children. So it's really a, it, it's a lot of joy to see the kids uh, screaming and clapping and, and just having a, having a really good time. And Move! Camp Independence is the only camp of the country designed to get kids with cerebral palsy involved in athletics. It's sponsored by St. Louis Children's Hospital. It is for these accomplishments and for those yet to be realized that the Academy and its members proudly present Keith Smith with the Distinguished Practitioner Award. Congratulations. <laughs> The Academy is proud to recognize Gary Bedard, CO, Fellow, with the Titus Ferguson Award for an outstanding career as a leader in the profession and a provider of quality care to individuals with disabilities. It is my pleasure to invite Tom Karaluski to join me on stage to share details on our award winner. Thank you, Lee. Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here this evening, and it's an honor <clears throat> and a privilege to present the Titus Ferguson Award to a very dear friend who represents everything that the award represents. So we're going to take a little walk down memory lane here so we can talk hear a little bit about Gary's past. Gary's career began as a combat medic and a clinical specialist in a 91 Charlie uh, company in the U.S. Army and received his LPN and EMT civilian credentials. He was a top student and honor soldier in his medic training company and second in the class in, in the 91 Charlie school. 
He continued his education and is a graduate of the University of Washington with a, uh, with a Bachelor of Science degree that includes a double major in prosthetics and orthotics. Gary has been involved in product development since his days as a research orthotist at the Rehabilitation Engineering Center at Children's Hospital, Stanford. He has extensive experience in the athletic knee brace business from being the Charter Vice President of Townsend Design and as R&D Project Manager at Becker Orthopedic. Mr. Bedard has developed many products that are widely used in the field. The orthotic workstation, the thermal clad powder coating system, the vac station thermal forming system, the vac station bench top thermal forming system, Comcore thermoplastic composites, and Comcore ankle forms all represent his product development. Gary has been involved with various educational programs for the Academy, serving as a program coordinator, on site coordinator, and presenter for various material science continuing education conferences. He has taught didactic practicum based seminars at all of the orthotic and prosthetic schools in the United States, along with advanced clinical thermal forming, thermoplastic composite, and lower limb orthotic clinical and fabrication courses in, wait for it, Australia, Austria, Canada, China, Denmark, the Dominican Republic, Ecuador, England, Finland, Germany, Guatemala, Holland, India, Italy, Malaysia, Mexico, Norway, Panama, Portugal, Puerto Rico, Scotland, Switzerland, Sweden, Spain, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, Thailand, Turkey, Yugoslavia, and 49 U.S. states. I just want to pause for a moment so that you can absorb that last statement. Think of all the global education that has occurred to change global behavior of everything he has taught. And one has to ponder, why is he missing that last state? <laughs> Come on, North Dakota. <laughs> Gary has served as chairman of the Lower Limb Orthotic Society, member of Continuing Education Committee, and vice chairman on the 1998 Associate Technician Education Task Force and Scientific Societies Council. He was also founding chairman of the Fabrication Sciences Society and served two terms. In 1999, Gary was selected as Educator of the Year and was a member of the second class of fellows of the Academy and in 2002 received the Academy Train Heart Award. In addition, he was the 2011 Academy Distinguished Practitioner Award winner. Gary has distinguished himself as a clinician, researcher, teacher, and leader for the profession. His dedication to high ethical standards, patient care, and professional development has led to a global transformation in the philosophy of thermoplastic science. His leadership serves as an example to all who know and work with him and is worthy of emulation by all who enter the profession. Gary, please join us on stage. It is for these accomplishments and many more that the Academy and its members proudly present Gary Bedard with the Titus Ferguson Lifetime Achievement Award. Thank you, Lee. And thank you for my long-term friend. I won't say old. Thank you to my long-term friend, Tom, for doing that presentation. <sighs> Good evening, members of the Academy and guests. Hopefully you found the gate training videos entertaining. Uh, usually the students only get to see those. Uh, I look at it as all part of making KAFOs great again. 
Or we could look at it as, you know, dancing with Gary. Um, I'd like to take this time to thank the, the Academy Board and executive officers for this award. It sure came as a surprise. The emotions are still a bit unsettled, and it will always be a mark in time. I still think I'm that blonde kid that's making knee braces, and obviously there's no more blonde hair here, so there's been a bit of a passage of time. Thank you to the board. Shelley, Manisha, all the staff of the national office, for all our years of collaboration, it's always been a pleasure. The award notification came from the immediate past president of the Academy, Rick Miller, another long-term friend. Thank you, Rick, for the gracious conversation on the phone. Of course, we played uh, phone and text tag for a few days. You know, it's where in the world is Gary at this point? Uh, ironically, I was just coming back from Honduras where I go to charge my salt water, water batteries. Uh, the only thing that was missing, though, was at the end of the notification that you didn't do a harmonica solo. Uh, since I've attended this meeting continuously since 1986, the notification brought to mind the previous recipients of the Titus Ferguson Award. My first thoughts were to those individuals and that those are some big shoes to fill. And quite frankly, they still feel pretty loose. Many of the previous recipients, ironically, had a direct impact on my own career. Last year's recipient, Frank Bostock, about a decade ago, invited me to train his orthotists that support Craig Hospital in their acute spinal injury work. From that opening, it led to me to work through 20 of the 24 members of the National Spinal Cord Injury Model, and that was an education process in itself. To the late Mike Shook when he was at Duke and involved with AOPA and president of AOPA, called me to invite me to be a train heart presenter. Ironically, I turned it down, which led to a really interesting conversation with Mike to Don Kotz, who engaged me in a long conversation to a, sec a nomination to the OPERF board, which I finally did, and it put me into contact with people that I've had a long-term respect for, and now I've been learning so much for them. And there's nobody that runs a conference call and a meeting like Don does. To Don Shore, I remember being at a regional Texas meeting for the Academy, and uh, I always use the regional meetings to kind of break in new material. And so I ran by an opening with, with Don. We both got a good laugh out of it. It bombed. But nonetheless, I remember that moment. To John Michael, it always seemed like I was elbow to elbow with him in the early years of stance control technology. And I'll tell you, if there's anybody of, that serves as a model of, to being an educator and a presenter, it certainly is John Michael. To my, I will say, old, old friend, Marty Carlson to the days that when I was at Stanford Children's Hospital and he was headed at OMP at Gillette Hospital. He was the first one to invite me to Gillette to ironically uh, do a paper on the use of thermoplastic materials and idiopathic scoliosis. What a surprise, huh? And um, uh, you've never, never felt the full concept of what it means to have farm to table food unless you've been at their dinner table with his wife, Peg, and they've taken the food off their farm and their, their son's farm next door that's an organic farm. It's truly an experience. To Maurice LeBlanc, who was director of research at Stanford, first person that exposed me to that concept of having grant money to develop concepts for our field and products. Uh, to Mel Stills, when he retired, gave me his personal Thermoforming Library, which is still part of my own library, because he was one of the early inceptors of that technology when he was at Moss back, back east. To Sam Hammondtree in the orthomedic days, that I always would pal around with my lab partner from school, Kel Bergman, and go to some of their industry events, and he always worked, welcomed me to those events, even though I wasn't an, an employee. To David Schultz, 
who brought me up to Wisconsin, introduced me to a whole network of people up there, to Herman Hittenberger. He'd come down from San Francisco to visit us with my practice partner, Gretchen Hecht, at Stanford, and always would check up on us, and always was such a gentleman. To Carlton Fillauer in that same era, coming in, and he took an idea that we were hand-making from Dr. Eugene Bleck. I was running the idiopathic service at that time, and I think we created the first commercial low-profile C-ring on a CTLSO. And it, that opened my eyes to, the, to, to the, that potential of making a product from a clinical experience and bringing it commercial. And finally, to Chuck Childs, the first recipient of the Titus Ferguson Award, and he was one of my examiners. So all through my career, these individuals who have given so much to this field were instrumental in terms of my own career. It is my hope that in some form and some impact with many of you that I've had just a touch of what those esteemed practitioners have done for me. I do not look at this award as a means of thanks. None of us really come into this field for thanks. There is too high a degree of altruism needed to engage every day with the clinical problems we are tasked with perhaps solving. Satisfaction comes from a job well done. Happiness is found in competence. I grew up in a blue collar family with a dad who was one of two electricians for a small city school department and my mom was secretary of one of those elementary schools. It was a gritty, deindustrialized New England mill town that some considered the Palo Alto of the Industrial Revolution. For myself, being born and raised there and then starting my own P career in Palo Alto, it was certainly a, a dichotomy of, of vast differences in, from different centuries. There was not much thanks in the execution of my parents' jobs. It was a worth ethic that you got up every day and you did your job. I can't count the weekends I pulled wire from my dad with all his side electrical jobs. To this day, it's a worth ethic that is still part of my nature. And even though they're not with me here, I still know that they are with me. If there's anyone that does deserve thanks, it's all those folks who have worked so hard to improve the whole process of educating our young practitioners. When I hear a young student say they found out about the field when they were in high school and progressed to the point of now being in a graduate program at one of our MSPO schools, it's a pure indication that the structure has vastly improved. I am envious of them in the solid education that re they receive these days and the wide avenue of postgraduate options that await them. It's something that just did not exist. It didn't exist when I came out of the military being trained as a medic and a nurse and I was looking to springboard off that event, off that experience. It was quite a rough process in those days. Now, in listening listening and hearing the stories of all you young practitioners and students. It seems that roughness has moved up the, the food chain a bit. If I could pull a wishbone from the experiential carcass of being a traveling orthotist, and I do have a million miles on American Airlines and a million miles on, Ameri on American and Delta. So that'll give you a frame of reference of, of that sign that was in Australia. My wish would be for a multi-organizational effort to build an institution residency model that we could use to encourage medical centers to host not only an OMP department, but a residency as well. Having lived in California for many years, I'll give you the example at UCSF. We all respect the residency program that they run. But within that same UC program, why doesn't UC Davis and UCLA have an equivalent residency program? And I'm sure there's other institutions that have, you know, basically could, could follow a model of residency and then eventually matriculate up to the pace for those PhDs that we have coming into the field. That would be my wishbone. If the, anybody deserves thanks, it's my daughter, Callan. The responsibility of my job 
required me to be on the road 110, 120 days a year. I miss parts of her young life. Of course, we made up for it from some of the pictures you, say, you saw, because boy, we were the water dog family. And there was nothing in my life that I enjoyed more than having a boat full of young kids every single weekend that I could. First with all her teammates from her volleyball years, and then later when the boys hung around, that was always re really interesting. <laughs> Especially when they would, you know, do the trash talking and get on the boat and they were going to do so good, you know, this is easy to do. And the girls would just slam them and just make it look so simple and sometimes they wouldn't even get up on a wakeboard. That was always good to see how that empowered all those young girls that we had on, on the boat. Um, of course, with the carrot comes the stick. Callan probably can't count the days that she had to pull an AFO with me in our garage with all the weird materials that flowed through that Silicon Valley garage. Thank you, daughter. I am so proud of you. She just double degreed out of UC Stanford, uh, UC Stanford, UC Santa Cruz uh, in December after finishing her volleyball season as a scholar athlete, co-captain of the team, and is now uh, coaching two club teams in her um, break year from graduate school. So the stick is still there because the stick still wants to make sure she's going to stay on track to go to, to grad school. If anyone deserves thanks, it's to the Becker management and family that it has always allowed great latitude in conducting educational programs to be focused on education and respectful to the company. If anyone deserves thanks, it's to all of you that have allowed me to evolve, be involved with this community in the manner that at times was a bit unconventional, in a manner that brought me into conversation with so many of you about so many interesting and difficult cases. Those conversations continue to be the best aspect of what I do. I hope I can continue and to be productive for a good number of years. And thanks to all of you for allowing me to be part of this tribe. Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. The Academy is pleased to bring you Randy Gravatt. Randy is a peak performance coach working with leaders, organizations, and teams to help them reach their potential. Please join me in welcoming Randy. Thank you, Alicia. Happy Valentine's Day, Academy. I'm so glad, actually, my picture was on the, the billboard out there in the hallway because when I was coming in, the lady was using the little scan code to let everybody in the door, and she said, you can't come in. You don't have a badge. And I said, well, uh, I really need to go in there. And she said, I'm sorry, no one's allowed without a badge. And so she's really doing her job, great job. And I said, well, can we go with my picture? And so she said, uh, I guess we can let you in. So here I am, thank you. And I almost didn't get here because I'm staying on the 19th floor, and the little elevator thing is confusing to me. I tried that. I, I, no lie. I came down to the 5th, and I ended up going to the 27th or 20th. I'm up and down on the elevator. I can't even get off, so I, I barely made it in here. I'm a total mess. I'm sitting with winners, though, so that's a good thing. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, the problem is, I guess, I'm a little bit high-maintenance. And, and I'm really impressed, you were talking about how you guys have, have just uh, pushed over a major milestone you, to be congratulated for that. But it's really impressive because there are actually some high maintenance people that you work with, right? I mean, you've, you've done this with a lot of high maintenance people. Actually, there's a new study out that shows that one out of every three people is now high maintenance. You're, you're laughing, but I'll prove it to you. So look to your left. And then look to your right. And if neither one of them is high maintenance, it's probably you. <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to see if tonight we can get a bunch of high maintenance people to work together to achieve high performance. Because I think a lot is on the line with the group of people in this room tonight. This academy 
is doing some amazing things, and yet there might be another layer you can reach to. If you are really truthful with yourself tonight, there, there's, there's another place I'm, I'm, I'm gathering that you can reach. Here's what I want you to do. During the next few minutes that we have together, I want you to take a good, hard look on the inside. We'll call it introspection. Okay, I want you to do some introspection here. It's, it's to inspect on the inside. You guys are all about inspections, right? There's all kind of government regulations you're inspecting all the time. But I want you to take a good, hard look in the mirror tonight at what's going on on the inside of you and ask yourself, are you really performing at the level that you could? And so I, I want to try to encourage you to do that. And, and so I don't want you just to take a look in the mirror, not just any mirror. So I, I'm staying up there in heaven tonight on that. Uh, it's way up there. So... I have a mirror in my, in my hotel room, and not just any mirror. I'm not talking about the one that you brush your teeth and look. It's that big mirror. But there's another mirror in my room. It's, it's this little bitty mirror on the side. Do you have this mirror in your room? This is a mirror no one should ever look into. <laughs> this mirror is like a fly eye. It's just boom. I mean, it, and I looked at that mirror a moment ago uh, before I came down here, and I thought, is this what they see when they look at me? I hope not. This is like a crazy mirror. you have this mirror? I want you to take that mirror literally and look at your leadership tonight and just take a, a real hard, up close and personal look, a look that won't hide any of the blemishes. You'll be honest with yourself. And, and you can say, this is what my current reality is. And that's where I want to be over these next few minutes. I hope you'll be able to do that. I, I love going and traveling and being in different places, airports, shopping malls. You get into those places, and I'm always looking for the same thing. It's happened to me today. I was traveling from Orlando to here, and I got in the airport, and I always look for the same thing, the sign that tells me where I am. It always has the same three little words. You go in a shopping mall, right? You find the kiosk, same three little words. What are those words? Little star. You are here. Yeah, they always say, this is this your current reality. This is where I want to go. You got Foot Locker, Belks, Pennies. You, you got a lot of options. You get to choose. This is where I want to go. And if you, if you turn toward where you want to go and you start taking steps, you all of a sudden make progress. And, and so tonight, that's what I want us to do. What is our current reality? Where do we want to go? Let's take steps toward that. And we'll make progress. Why? Because your direction always determines your destination. And we can take some steps tonight. And I think as a result of what happens in these next few minutes, I'm crazy enough to believe that you can help even more people. You can be better yourself. I think it can just be an incredible year coming up. So I learned to play checkers from my grandfather. It was, I don't know, I was maybe eight years old. It was, it was 100 years ago. It was a long time ago. This is, this is just, I mean, forever ago. We're, we're in a little country town in northwest Georgia, and he's got a little country store near his home. This is a, a, a moon pie and RC cola kind of little hole-in-the-road place where he lives. And he challenges me to a game of checkers. And I'd never played before. I found out later he couldn't beat my grandmother anymore, so he challenges me. <laughs> we play the game. He pulls out the board. He says, this is a very simple game, son. He says, he says there's two colors. There's red and there's black. Two rules. Red has to go first, and you have to take your jumps. I'm like, okay, I have no idea what that means. I, I pushed the first little red one out, and he says, no, I, I forgot there's another. you got to go diagonally. And I'm like, okay, whatever. So the next thing you know, I mean, 90 seconds in, all the red ones are disappearing. The kings are, are appearing on the black ones. They're getting kinged up. And I find myself maybe two minutes in, over in the two corner, just kind of back and forth trying to survive. You know what I'm talking about? He flushes me out, and I lose the very first game. I lost the next game, and the next game, and the next game, and the next game. I lost every game for about five years. I was about 12, and I finally beat my grandfather. And it was the last game we were ever able to play. And don't be sad, he didn't die. He moved on to my little brother after that. No, no. And so I go back to my to my hometown, which is about 20 miles away, and I take my checkerboard one day. We're not the Nintendo kids where, where I, now, now I know you're going all you students. I love students. They're, they're thinking, what's Nintendo? Google it. It's like a, a 1900s, you know, it's a, it's a video game. We don't have those where I'm from, though. There, there was one kid who had Pong. That's in the Wayback Machine. Some of you are old enough to know what I'm talking about. But I mean, we're, we're not those kids. We got, not, we got a checkerboard and a, and a ball glove and a bat, and it's raining this day, so we're going to play checkers. So I go down to my friend Eric's house, and I walk in, and I say, hey, you want to play some checkers? And he says, the game has changed, bro. I don't play checkers anymore. I'm like, what are you talking about? 
He said, I play chess now. <laughs> now, there's 3,000 people in our, in our hometown like, like we're going to have a chess club. This, this, is, this is a joke. Okay, you, you're educated people. We, we are not those people that are playing chess. Some of y'all may know how Eric somehow figures this out, learns it from somebody, maybe over in Dalton, I don't know. But it, I mean, he comes back over, I, I play chess now. I'm like, what's chess? And here's what he does. He says, flip over your checkerboard. Now, back in the day, on the back side of a checkerboard, red and black on one side, it's white and black on the other. Same number of squares. It looks the exact same. I thought, I thought they were both checkerboards. I thought we just had the Georgia checkerboard, you know, Falcons and Bulldogs, red and black. I just thought that's the Georgia checkerboard. I had no idea. He goes, no, this is a chess board over here. I'm like, really? And he pulls these pieces out and starts pouring them on the table. Not red and black. He's got white ones and black ones. He's got a little horse. I said, what's this one do? He said, this one right here. He goes up two and over one or over one and up two. And, 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 and I said, what's this one? It's, it's, it's the bishop. It's got a little point on the top. He said, this one goes diagonally all over the board. What's this one? It looks like a castle. He goes side to side and up and down. I said, what's this one? It's kind of tall. He said, that's the queen. She's a woman. She'll go anywhere she wants to go. <laughs> I'm like, wow, man, this is a cool game. Little did I know this, this game would become a metaphor for my life and my leadership, and I think it's one for yours as well. It's like somebody has come in. Gary could tell you this. Over the last few years, Alicia, you go all the way back to, to where you started. It's like somebody's flipped the board, and there's a whole new deal going on. This happened in my career. My very first job, my next-door neighbor, his grass is getting kind of long, I take my push mower, I push it across the property line, and I say to this guy, hey, would you be willing to let me cut your grass? He goes, oh, my goodness, that'd be great. I'll give you $2.50 an hour, however long it takes. You just have at it. I'm in business. I do a pretty good job. He comes out at the end. He pays me my money. He, he says, I've got an office park not far away. He said, you, you, you want to come water my flowers and, and mow the grass over there? And he said, you, you got a job. And, and the next thing you know, I did okay at that job, and I got another job, and all these jobs, and and." Several years later, now i got a bunch of people I'm overseeing, millions of dollars of budgets, land and buildings and all kinds of stuff. It's, it's like managing stuff that happened in my personal life. I met a girl, and I said, hey, you want to you wanna, you wanna get married? And, and we did, and we moved to Texas, and I'm telling you, it's like the whole board got flipped over. You, you, you get married, and it's like, whoa, what just happened? The game changed. And, and so we moved to Texas, and we had a little girl. And, and now it was like really changed. It's like an alter three-dimensional board going on now because there's two of them and one of me, and this is crazy. And I'm like, whoa, this is nuts. We moved to Tennessee, and we had another little girl. And then we moved from our apartment in Tennessee to our house in Tennessee, and we had another little girl. <laughs> then we moved to Atlanta, and we had another little girl. And I look at my wife and I said, baby, we've got to quit moving. <laughs> this cannot be anymore. And so now there's these five women that I'm living with. It is crazy. It's like this whole thing going on. When you think about your life and you look back at where you were and where you are now, think about all the technology changes you've had to deal with. You've had family changes and relationship changes. You've got, you've got, you've got people that you're serving that are, that are they have, there's competition that's against you now and then regulations that are, you're, I mean, it's like the whole thing is, it's just a, it's a, it's a different ball game, right? As you look back, checkers, think about it. It's a, it's a very, um, it's a strategic game. High performance organizations play chess. Uh, chess is a strategic game. High-performance organizations play chess. They don't play checkers. Checkers, think about it. It's a fly-by-the-seat-of-your-pants game, right? It's a, it's a very frenetic pace. It's a, it's, let's be busy, and, and, and this is what happens. We get really busy, and we, we mistake activity with accomplishment if we're not careful. And so tonight, I want to challenge you to not fly by the seat of your pants, but to build a high-performance organization. Now, you say, what? Well, that, that, and, and let's just throw the, throw the elephant out in the room here. We've got a, we got a vast uh, diversity in this room, right? You've got, you got students, and you've got professors and teachers, and you've got clinicians, and you've got people working in a hospital, and you've got engineers. I mean, you, this is a very diverse group of people here, what you do. But it's all to one end. In a, in a sense, if you think about it. 
And so what would happen if every person in this room would go back in the places where you have influence and, and chase this definition of high performance? It's the ability to achieve and maintain a level of superior results and a competitive advantage over an extended period of time. If you think about high performance organizations, and some would come to mind, right? If you, you start Apple and Google, and I was just in Orlando, people talk about Disney be, being great. And, and, and we think about, sometimes we think about sports teams that are great. I mean, the Patriots have been really good for a long time. I, I'm very impressed with, with what the Warriors have done the last couple of years, but I'm more impressed with the San Antonio Spurs, who've won five championships in 15 years. And they've got sustained, I think they're chasing greatness. I don't think they're chasing a championship. And so as you think about your life tonight, do you have a place where you're saying, I, I really am chasing greatness, or are you just really kind of going with the flow and, and flying by the seat of your pants? It's so easy to do. It's so easy to play checkers in a world that now demands us to play chess. Think about chess. Each piece, every person on your team, unique in their ability to contribute and collaborate and design and help, and yet, if we try to treat every piece the same, it, it, it doesn't work. Chess, you have to think three or four moves ahead, much more strategic. And so as you go into your work, at whatever it is you do, I want to challenge you to live by design, not by default. To live by design. I think if we're not careful, we can just find ourselves floundering, not headed toward where we want to be going. The best leaders live by design, not by default. So, here's what I want to do tonight. I want to take our remaining time and I want to share with you four moves that I think will help you live a high performance life and be a high performance leader in your classroom or hospital or clinic or wherever you go next week when you go back. So let me, let me give you this first move that high performance organizations make and I'd encourage you to write these down. I think this will be helpful to you. The first thing they do is they bet on leadership. They bet on leadership. I've not found a high performance organization anywhere. I've not found a high performance whatever it is, environment at all, without a, without a good leader. And they're all well-led. Growing leaders grow organizations. Winners win, don't they? I mean, it's amazing. And, and, I'm, and I say it all the time, your capacity to grow determines your capacity to lead. So as you go into 2018, I got a question for you. What are you doing to grow yourself? I got on an airplane this morning and the stewardess stands up and she reminds us all, if something goes wrong, there's going to be an oxygen mask that's going to drop down. Here's what we want you to do. We want you to put it on yourself first. You can help everybody else if you're able to, to breathe yourself. I think some of us, if we're not careful, we can get in such a frenetic pace, we can be checker playing in our mindset. And if we're not careful, we don't take any time to develop ourselves. We are. Um, so concerned about the people we're helping, and rightly so. I mean, you're changing their world. But if you can't maintain your own soul, and you, you can't maintain your own pace, and you, and you can't maintain your own emotions, you're going to really struggle to be able to help others with a fully engaged heart. And so I want to challenge you to, to ask yourself the question, to take out that mirror and say, have I taken much time to work on me lately? I had a leader tell me recently, he said, lead, the best leaders spend half their time working on themselves and half their time working on their business. The percentages may be off, but I can tell you this, if you don't spend any time working on you, you're going to really struggle to sustain and have a career that's going to go, go the distance. And so I challenge you to really do that. So i got a question for you. What do you need to do to invest in your leadership during 2018? What do you need to do differently to invest in your own personal leadership during the coming year. So you can make sure that the gauges in your life, the emotional gauge and the, the relational gauge and the vocational gauge, all those gauges, the spiritual gauge, whatever gauges are important to you, you can make sure they're pegged over to the right with a full tank, not running on empty all the time. And I'm guessing in a room this large, there's some people in here, you're running on empty right now. So take some practical steps, some tactics to, to move toward that. Now let me, let me pause right here because I'm going to have four or five of these questions for you over the next few minutes. I want to pause here for a second and I want, to, I, want to, I want to come clean with you. So I'm actually a Bible reader. I love to read the Bible. You may or may not like to read the Bible, but there's a verse in the Bible that says this. It says, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only who fool themselves. It's in the book of James. Be ye doers of the word 
and not hearers only who fool themselves. Now, this is a verse that your preacher, anybody in here go to church, if you go to church, you go and your preacher would say something like this. I'm telling you some good stuff here, but you got to go, you got to go do what we're talking about and not just hear it and walk away and not do anything with it. Because if you do that, you're just fooling yourself. So I'm going to steal from the preacher here. Can, we get, can you steal from your preacher? I don't know. But I'm going to steal from the preacher this verse. And, and I'm going to challenge you this week, not just tonight, but tonight's going to be one of those moments. But the rest of this week, you're going to hear so much great stuff, and you can fool yourself into thinking it was enough just to be here and go back and put the book on the shelf or the notes in the drawer and not do anything with you and with it. And I don't think it's going to do you really a lot of good if you don't go activate what's been said this week. So you can hear a lot of great stuff. I challenge you to go do some stuff with that. So, so what can you do to develop yourself that's been triggered in your mind just these last few minutes as we've talked about this? So here's another um, picture I want to show you. This is a, this is a, um, a reminder that we're going to go and invest in other people, not just invest in yourself. It sounds actually selfish to invest in ourselves, but if you don't put that oxygen mask on first, you're going to struggle to help other people, but you do want to help other people. So my wife comes to me several years ago and she says, Randy, your job is going to be to teach the girls how to drive. I'm like, okay, that's cool. I got this. I mean, I've been, you know. So here's what I decided to do. I'm going to get a process. I'm going to have a process to develop these daughters. And so this is, this is a picture of daughter number four right here. All the daughters went through the same thing. Now, I'm going to sit right here. This is what I do. I go over here. I'm sitting in the car. I, I'm in the driver's seat. You're going to sit over here. We're going to leave the keys in the house, just in the driveway. We're just going to sit here. We're not, I mean, we, this is, we're going to start right here. I'm going to show you all these little buttons, tell you what they do. I'm, 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 I'm going to, I'm, I'm developing a driver. Next time you sit in the driver's seat, I sit over here. You tell me about the buttons. Keys still in the house. We eventually got to the point where she's able, each one of them is able to drive on the driveway. We move to the street. We get out in the neighborhood. There's a class, a driver's ed. There's a process, a curriculum. There's all kind of stuff to help develop these drivers. We eventually get out into the freeways. And now I have my own little, little owners of vehicles that are all over the country. There was a process. I don't want to just wing it. And, and go by default, play checkers when it comes to helping these people develop this skill of driving. Now, when you think about the people that you have influence over, do you have a process and are you thinking about their development? You don't want to wing it. Go back to my picture if you would. That picture is interesting. This is the day before dri Catherine's driver's test. You can tell she's fired up over there. That's my wife, Laura, who was a fifth grade school teacher at the time. I said, can you help us out? She puts on the lab coat, real red pen, got the notebook. She comes out and she's going to give her her little practice driver's test. Now I know this. If Catherine can pass this part, she can handle anything any Georgia troopers got to throw at her on the next day. Right? This is your pre-test. As you think about the people you're developing, do you put them in stressful situations? Do you put them in challenging? Are you stretching them? Are you in their face? Are you encouraging them and inspiring them and believing in them? I love what Gary did when he received his award. He named a bunch of people who have believed in him. I got people who have believed in me. I certainly wouldn't be here tonight if it weren't for Miss Daniels, one of my when our guidance counselor, really, when I was in high school. She says to me, she said, I think you have what it takes to go to college. Now, I know that doesn't sound impressive to all of you, but nobody in my family had ever gone to college, and we had a couple hundred of us in my high school, and four years after we graduated from high school, there were about four or five of us that had a degree, and I was one of those four or five, and it wouldn't have happened without Miss Daniels. It wouldn't have happened without Miss Franklin, who was my first English teacher I had when I got to Young Harris College back in 1983. Miss Franklin, this is interesting, the, the registrar gives me, a, they, or they, my, my, my coach gives me a, a, a list. He said, you need to go see the registrar with this. I go see the registrar, and I'm signing up for my classes. So they put me in remedial English. I'm fired up. I mean, I'm thinking, this is really cool. I got in remedial English. I called my mom. My mom hadn't been to college. She's not educated, but she's really smart. I told her, I said, Mom, they put me in remedial English. This is awesome. She goes, son, they're going to give you a dictionary when you get in the class. You need to look up remedial. It doesn't mean what you think it does. <laughs> I get in this class. I'm serious. I get in this class. There's seven other people in the class that don't speak English either. They got excuses. They're from other countries. I'm not. It's like, this is a disaster. I get my first paper back from Miss Franklin. It's blood red. I mean, it is awful. But a little smiley face at the top, and Miss Franklin says this. 
She says, you, you could be a really good communicator if you ever figure out the sentence thing. You could be dangerous. <laughs> Miss Daniel and Miss Franklin would be proud tonight that I could even stand up and, and talk in front of you, but I think they knew that would happen at some point because they believed in me. They saw stuff in me, and had they not, I wouldn't be where I am. Gary's mentioned these people when he was talking a minute ago. I love that because one of my favorite quotes is this, those who drink the water should never forget those who dug the well. You students, there are people who are digging, have been digging a well for decades for you to be in this profession. And I challenge you to pay it forward as you go forward. But for all of us in the room, maybe the best thing we could do tonight to pay it forward would be to invest in someone else, but it would also be to go back and thank those who've invested in us. They may be long gone. You may not be able to do that, but if you can, I encourage you to go back and say, hey, I wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for you. So I've got a question for you. Who are you going invest, to invest in during 2018? This idea of betting on leadership, it's, it's just, am I going to push my chips into the middle of the table and bet on someone else? People have bet on you. Now, let me warn you, if you do this, it's going to get messy, but it's going to be fun. Look at that picture. There's nothing better than just going, you bet on somebody, they get it, and boom, there it is. That's all, and that's a fun picture, isn't it? But, but I got to warn you, if you go here, I told you, it's going to get really messy. You start betting on people, you start betting on your students, they're going to write 10-point font. I mean, you, you're going to, it's, it's going to get ugly, right? It's going to get ugly. If Catherine would take two steps to her left, you would notice there's a dent in that right back door. <laughs> If she would come right over here to this, about where you guys are sitting at this table, about, about 10 steps to her right, you'd find in our driveway lamppost 2.0 because 1.0 is gone. <laughs> it's been backed over. We got a dent in our garage door. We've had a speeding ticket through the year. That little car last year got totaled on the freeway. 18-wheeler. Everybody's okay. But oh my goodness, if you start betting on people, and pushing your chips to them, they're going to disappoint you. They're going to let you down. But, but I don't know any other way that you can live a high-performance life without investing in other people. The best organizations in the world, they bet on leadership. The best leaders do as well. The second thing they do is they act as one. They act as one. Act as one is about alignment. Alignment multiplies impact. I wasn't real good in English, but I was pretty good in math. And I can tell you multiplication is a lot better than addition, right? You know that. It's like you multiply your efforts when you get people aligned. I want you to picture a tug of war going on. As a leader, you're on one side of the rope, or it, just as you live your life, lead your class, your clinic, whatever it is, you're, you're on one side, and, and everybody else is on the other side of the rope. And there are days you feel like, I'm pulling this way, they're pulling that way. Will you please come in on time? And they're, they're over here thinking, I might not even come. I might call in sick, right? They're, they're, I mean, it's just like a struggle. Great leaders understand that they got to go and build a leadership team, and so they get a couple people to come over here with them. So some of you, you got some people that are helping you. They're collaborating with you. You're growing stuff and building stuff, but you still got other people over here that you're leading and trying to influence. And, and what would happen if we could get everyone on the same side of the rope pulling in the same direction, not against each other, but against the competition toward the goal, toward what we are trying to accomplish. Alignment multiplies impact. It's this we over me mentality. Notice the, the, the we over me there. There's only really one thing that's happened. We've just flipped one. We, we, we went from a checker playing me mindset to a more strategic, more collaborative, just flip the M, and it becomes a we. The thing I love about you even coming to this uh, this, this, this week, this conference, is that you've said, I want to be a part of something. It's not just about me. There are other people who would choose to not even come. Just to be here says that you, you, you're, in, you're on board with what we're talking about. But if you look down in your heart, do you have an agenda? Or are you really trying to invest in, in a group of people that are trying to do something great together? There's so much importance of alignment in your organization. Now, you say, how do we know if we're aligned? Well, let me, I'll give you one little idea. This is a tactical thing you could do. Take a three by five card when you get back on Monday and give to every single person in your, in your, um, in your, in your environment, wherever you are, and ask them, what's my number one priority for the year? What's our number one priority for the year? 
and see what happens. Great leaders take the time to create clarity about the vision, what we're trying to accomplish. I was sitting with a, with a business leader uh, a while back. We were out in Dallas, and there's a room full of business leaders. This is a pretty impressive group of people that I was having an opportunity to have breakfast with. And there's a lady on my left. She's a multi-million dollar business owner. She's sitting here. And there's a lady on the stage that's talking about alignment. And, she, and here's what the woman is saying. She says, I want you to take out your phone, and I want you to text your top four leaders in your business, these are business owners, your, your top four people in your business, and I want you to text them and ask them, what's my number one priority for the year? And so they do. All these business leaders do this. This woman sitting by me, she leans over at the end, and she says, Randy, look at this. All four of my leaders said the exact same thing verbatim. I said, congratulations, that's awesome. She said, no, it's not. This is not my number one priority. <laughs> Here's what she said. She said, they're crystal clear about the wrong thing. They're crystal clear on the wrong And then she raises her hand and takes out the fly eye mirror, and she looks at herself, and she said, that's on me. It's this way because I'm the leader, and I've allowed this to happen. And here's what she said. She said, I'm going to go back, and I'm going to make sure that they know what we're trying to accomplish. Some of you could give your people a real gift if you would just be more clear about what you're trying to do. Alignment multiplies impact. So as we think about 2018, where do you need to create alignment with those you lead during the coming year? Best leaders, best organizations in the world, they bet on leadership and they act as one. Is there a place where you need to go activate and say, you know what, I've not been real clear on the vision. Or everybody, I'm not, maybe I haven't been living out the values. We say this and we got a little, you know, poster on the wall, but we don't hold people accountable to that. Are there systems and structures and things that, did you say, I, got, I just got to go back and get more clear. Bet on leadership and act as one. Here's, here's the third one. The best organizations, the best leaders, they take time to win the heart of the people that they're leading. They take time to win the heart. You say, what do you, what do you mean win the heart? That sounds kind of, it's kind of soft here. That's like a, love deal, right? I mean, it's Valentine's. I thought we'd talk about winning the heart. This one's about engagement. Engagement. Engagement energizes effort. You ever been around somebody that was disengaged or sort of engaged, kind of half engaged, and they're not, they're not pulling their weight? Everybody else is pulling their weight, and you got somebody over here weighing it down? That's a really frustrating thing when, when that's going on. You know what sometimes happens? We fail to win the hearts of our people by fostering their dreams, we're talking, Mark, about Matthew Kelly and the dream manager and some of, some of the, th the idea about fostering the dreams of your people. I heard a business leader a couple weeks ago, I'm working with a business, and this guy said, we ask our people to check their hearts at the door. And I said, that's not going to work, buddy. It's not going to work. People never check their hearts. They, they bring, every day, their hearts stay in their chest, right? They come in, and they feel stuff, and they... They believe stuff, and they hurt, and, and there's things going on at home, and they, and they bring all that with them. And you, it, Good luck if you think you can get people to check their heart at the door. I'll tell you what you can do, though. You can win the hearts of your people by fostering their dreams and sharing ownership and giving them a challenge and some of those kind of things. But one of the things you can do to build, uh, to, to foster, um, to, to win the hearts of your people, one of the things you can do to win the hearts of your people is you can build community. Build community. Let me, let me define community when I say this. When I say community, let me, let me define it for you here. So community is a place where people know and are known. Do you know the people that are in your class or in your clinic or that, that are your patients? Do you really know their story? Or, or are you saying, eh, I'm not really fully interested in their heart. I just want to make them well. Well, I'm just going to challenge you to, to go deeper with people and to listen to them. And not only know them, but you've got to let them know you. You give them dignity when you let them know you. Uh, serve and are served. Community is a place where we serve each other. I don't just serve you. Some of us are real good at serving the people around us, but when it comes to people serving us, it's like, mm, I don't, you, I'm not real good at letting you serve me. Well, that's, the community's not going to grow if that doesn't happen. Here's, here's another piece, and this is where it gets like, you're going to say love in a, in a business room? And I am. People need to be loved. And you need to be loved. And when you have that going on, community begins to grow. Some of you have been in the military in the past. You know that people don't, they don't die for flags and freedom. 
They die for their friend in the foxhole next door. And they, they die for their family back home. They give their life for that stuff. You work with a lot, a lot of people that have experienced tremendous pain and, and given tremendous sacrifice because of this word love. Here's another one. We celebrate and we grieve together. When you get that going on, and I think sometimes we fail to celebrate. I thought it was great when, when Alicia gets up here and says, no, we did it. And everybody just explains. I mean, it's just great to celebrate. Sometimes you're just in the grind day after day after day, and you're pushing the boulder up, and we get it over the hill, and, and it goes down, and then we, we, we do look for another hill. And rightly so. It's one of my favorite sayings. There's an old Haitian proverb, de mon je mon. It means beyond mountains there are mountains, and leaders love to climb mountains. But I think sometimes if we're not careful, we don't celebrate like you took time to do there for a second and to celebrate accomplishment here. Those are really great things. But, and while most of us probably need to celebrate a little more, that's not nearly as important as this idea of grieving together. I mean, it's real easy to be there for people when things are rolling and things are good, but do we grieve with the people who are hurting around us? A lot of times we're going, I don't, I don't want to be any part of that. I love Rudy Giuliani's, um, I think this is autobiography. There's a chapter that says, that I love the title of this chapter. It says, Weddings are optional, funerals are mandatory. What's he saying? He's saying anybody can be there when things are good. But when we show up for people when things are not so good, it actually wins their heart. It's an engagement play. Now, I, want, I do want to say this. I want to do a little commercial here. I've, I've written a book about living a life of engagement. It's a book called Unstuck. Sam from Twitter, where are you? You're, you're here? She, come here. I'm going to give you a copy of this book. I didn't bring one. I want the rest of you to go on Amazon and buy it. That'd be great. So, okay. But I'm going to give one to Sam because Sam today tweets out, does anybody know who the keynote speaker is this year? And so I tweeted back. I said, I do. It's me. You know, so, I got, so Sam, I embarrass you. So I got you a signed copy of Unstuck right there. You're welcome. Thank you. So that's good. Thank, yeah, that's good. So I'll say something about this. This book, and we've written another book called Finding Your Way, and for, it's, it's a book that is being used by students all over the place to help them discover what they're born to do. So this book, both these books are about living with engagement. I think engagement is huge. How much wasted potential is taking place because people don't live engaged lives? So. I'll show you a picture here of my crew. This is, this is who I roll with. It's my wife, Laura, my Valentine on my right uh, here. And these are our four um, women. And this is the estrogen ocean we're standing in front of here. <laughs> so, this is great. So, so in 1986, Thanksgiving Day, I get down on this knee right here. I look Laura in the face and I say, will you marry me? And she's a fifth grade school, or I, I think she was teaching fifth grade. This is her first year of teaching at the time. And so school teacher would do what? They would answer in a complete sentence, right? So she says, yes, I will marry you. And at that moment, we were engaged. Now, here's what I found out later. She didn't want me to be engaged only on that day. She wasn't looking for me to be engaged just from that day to the wedding day. She still, after 30 years of marriage, is expecting to me to be fully engaged even today, every day. She's back there in the back of the room. I'm going to take her and get beignets tonight. I, 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 gotta, I mean, you got to do stuff when you're engaged, right? You wouldn't believe what I've done for this woman beyond raising four other women. I mean, it's crazy what I've done. I, I, I mean, I took her to see Wicked on Broadway. Have you seen Wicked? Oh my goodness, I didn't know what it was. I go in there, I'm laughing, I'm crying, I'm in love with a witch. It was unbelievable. It, I mean, you need to go see Wicked. I had no idea. I bought her flowers. I mean, I, you would not believe the things I've done. Why? Because she won my heart. Now, let me, let me tell you, we have a deal that you don't have with your people. I got that. I mean, the deal we made was sort of a, I mean, it, not sort of, it was a lifetime deal. That's the deal we made. I even tell her, I say, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you. <laughs> I mean, that's the deal we made. I say, Your people can leave you, but I'm guessing they won't want to if you win their heart. People do not leave organizations usually. They leave leaders. 
So, what is it that you need to do to create greater engagement to win the hearts of your people? Let's don't ask them to check them at the door. Let's look at the reality and say, how can we foster deeper community where we are? You might need to write something down here and say, I need, I need to activate that. I need to go back. Somebody needs a, a word of encouragement. Somebody needs some affirmation. Somebody needs to be validated in their effort. Somebody needs to be challenged and held accountable. What do you need to do? Here's one more. The idea of excelling at execution. Excelling at execution. Now, people love it when we talk about execution and leadership. They're like, oh, that's it. Let's make more products. Let's make more money. Let's make more stuff. Let's, let's make it, you know, let's, let's get after it. They love execution. And, and I got that. I mean, it's, it's important. Why? Because it, greatness hinges on execution. You have to execute what it is you're trying to do in your classroom, in your clinic. You've got you to gotta execute if you're going to be great. I get that. If the, if, if the packages didn't show up the next day, FedEx would not be great. If the movies didn't make you cry, Disney, you know, I mean, the rides have to work, the, the park's got to be clean, all that stuff. That's, that's why we, we judge them on that. But, but let me back up here for a second and warn you. If all you focus on is execution, you're going to really leave a lot of results on the table. You say, what do you mean? If you skip leadership, alignment, and engagement and only go after execution, you won't execute as well. It's like the gymnast who would say, I just want to do the dismount. If she forgets that it's the entire routine that creates the momentum that propels her to stick the landing, she's leaving points on the table. But make no mistake, the judges will ultimately judge you on do you stick the landing. So all these things work together, but at the end of the day, we got to excel at execution. We got to excel at execution. So I want to tell you the story of this guy, Dick Fosbury. And, and some of you have heard of him. If you've been around uh, as long as I have, you know him. He, he, he is the one who came up with a different way to high jump. Story goes back in 1963. He's just, a, I think, ninth grader back in Oregon. And, and the minimum height for the, for the high jump to get into the high school competitions was five feet. And Dick Fosbury couldn't go over five feet. He couldn't even clear the, the minimum, like the... All the kids that, you know, in the high jump, in the high school, they're all doing that. He can't do that much. And so he says, i got to come up with something different. And so he started experimenting with his coach, and, and he says, i got an idea. I mean, everybody at that time was going over the bar forward. They were rolling over it or scissoring over it. There was a, there was a way that everybody in the world jumped. I mean, it was just the way you high jump. And Dick Fosbury says, we're going to come up with a new way. This is a high schooler. He says, I'm going to go over the bar backwards head first. That ought to work. <laughs> and five years later in Mexico City, he won a gold medal at seven feet four and a quarter inches, backwards and head first. Is there a place in your leadership right now where you need to look inside and go, man, I'm just not getting the results I want, and I need to do something different? We've got a room full of innovators in this room. We need you to keep pushing the envelope and innovating and being different. But maybe there's a place in your personal life tonight where you're going, I'm just not satisfied with my current results. And I need to, I got to be honest with you, you're getting what you're getting because you're doing what you're doing. Your current behaviors are perfectly designed to give you your current results. Your grades aren't where they need to be. You, you got to behave differently to get that. You're not, you, you, an invention, you're going, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take more time than maybe what you're putting into it right now. Or maybe some more people, or some more insight. Maybe there's something you've got to let go of to get more. I, I, don't know, I, I don't know what it is for you tonight. But I know we've got to, if we're going to excel at execution, we've got to keep pushing the envelope. We've got to keep trying stuff. We've got to keep reinventing. We've got to keep raising the bar. So one of the companies I do a lot of work with is Chick-fil-A. Anybody Chick-fil-A fan in the room? You got, yeah, we got a couple of people loving eating more chicken. That's good. So I'm up in a, in a Chick-fil-A restaurant in Richmond, Virginia, uh, back in July, and I'm, I'm having a, a conversation with the owner of this restaurant. I said, tell me what you got going on. His name's Mark. I said, tell me what you got going on. He said, we've been doing a sweet tea give, or, or, or a sweet tea upsell. So what's that? 
He said, everybody comes in, we're trying to sell them a gallon of sweet tea, and if we do, we're, we're taking $2 of what they pay for it and donating it to a children's cause here in town. I said, well, that's cool. Y'all are raising some money. He said, no, it's better than that. He said, the whole market is doing this. 20 restaurants all been doing this. I said, well, that's, that's awesome, man. How, how's it going? I mean, how did it go? I mean, June's over. I mean, that's when they done, did it. And he, here's what he said. he said. He said, I go to my team, and I said, what do you think our goal should be? And, and his team, a bunch of young people, they said, Mark, I think, I think our goal should be number one in the market. We should be number one out of all 20 restaurants. And he says, I don't think that should be our goal. And they're stunned. They're like, because they're kind of a high performance team. And, he, and they said, you got to be kidding me. Why not? He said, that doesn't even matter. He said, I think our goal should be to sell a thousand gallons of tea. Now, do the math on that. 30 days, thousand gallons, if they pull this off. I said, how did it go? He said, he said, I'll tell you how it went. He said, by the end of the month, my buddies I play golf with are coming to me saying, if you don't tell those teenagers to quit trying to sell me tea with my biscuits, I'm not coming back to your restaurant anymore. He said, we're selling tea to everybody. It was crazy. I said, how many gallons, Mark? 1,104 gallons. I'm like, wow. I said, how'd you do in the market? He said, oh, we were number one. No, no problem there. I said, what was the second place restaurant? He said, they sold 476 gallons. And here's what Mark said. He said, if we'd have sold 500 gallons, we would have felt really good about ourselves. We're number one in the market. We're better than who? You fill in the blank. Some of us, we look around at mediocre competition or people that aren't as focused on what it is we are. We, we think we're just a little bit better than everybody else. And if we're not careful, We'll judge ourselves by the people around us rather than by our potential. And I believe this. I believe there's greatness in every person in this room. And I believe you can reach for more during 2018. My question is, for you personally, how do you need to raise the bar this year? How do you need to raise the bar this year? Is there a place where you need to reach for more? You've been, you've been kind of coasting. You're, you're, you're living off your intellect, and we're, we're real proud for you that you're smarter than the rest of us, but, but you're not really pushing yourself. Or some of you, you just got, you know, maybe, maybe you've just kind of checked out, and you're, maybe you're just you're, you're the person leading you. You feel disengaged from them, and so you're just kind of justified in your mind. Well, it's okay if I, if I, don't, if I don't go for it. When I was flying over here today, um, well, before I do that, I want, I'll, I'll tell you this in one second. Before I do that, I, I want to I want to give you something tonight that'll help you reach for higher performance. So, we've created an app with um, four layers of leadership development: lead self, if you're leading others, if you're leading a team, or if you're leading a, a trying to lead a, an organization. Um, we've got an integrate leadership app. I'd love for you to get this all free. If you'll go to your iOS or to your Android mobile, you, you can download that and use it. And this will be a way that you can raise the bar on your leadership this year. The chestnut checkers would be a, a place for you to start. It's five or six week little certification. You can develop your team, share that with them. But start with yourself. I mean, there's four layers, a bunch of stuff there for you if, you if you'll use that. Give it to anybody you want to. We're really trying to grow a generation of integrity-based leaders. When I flew over here today, I, uh, I was reminded of this statement. Hope is not a strategy. Hope is not a strategy. You'll never hope your way to high performance. You will behave your way to high performance. The seats on that airplane today that we had were the comfort seats. Now, those are nice seats. You ever, you ever, you ever sit in the comfort seats? If you haven't, and you've just sat in the back in those back seats, I mean, I've been in those back seats a lot. I've I got a lot of miles to, you know, I've been in those back seats before. Today, we were in the Delta comfort seats. These are really cool seats. They got more leg room. It's just, it's just you, you just, man, you look behind you and you just go, man, I, I feel like I, I'm in a pretty good place right here. Until you look in front of you. I mean, there's one row right up here in front of us today. And there is what's called what? First class. Now, those seats, those are unbelievable seats. I know because, because I can see through the curtain. They have a curtain, which is totally crazy if you think about it. This is the dumbest curtain on earth. It's a mesh curtain. 
It's a marketing play, I'm convinced. Because when you see through this curtain, you see these people with goblets and grapes and on thrones up there, right? I mean, you, you know what I mean? I mean it's first class. It's like that. Now, the question is, why did I sit in the comfort seats instead of in first class? Those were actually available to me. I'll tell you why. I wasn't willing to pay the price. I wasn't willing to pay the price. They were as available to me as they were the people who were sitting in them. And I wasn't willing to pay the price. Some of you may be in this room tonight and you've gotten to a point where you're feeling pretty good about where you are. And that's great. But I would ask you tonight, if you take that mirror out and you really look on the inside, have you gotten to a place where you're playing it safe? You're, you're, you're just comfortable. Here's what I learned really just a few years ago. Leaders are never comfortable being comfortable. Leaders are always comfortable when they're being courageous. Leaders are always comfortable when they're being courageous, when they're taking new territory, when they're looking at that next mountain, when they're looking at that next challenge. And I would challenge you tonight to not be comfortable, to not look back and say, well, I'm a little better than all of them, or I'm a lot better than them. This feels pretty good right here. There's another level. There's a first class level. It's rooted in the old Latin word quantuus. Quantuus, it means as great as you choose. There is greatness in every person in this room. And I believe you can be as great as you choose to be. You have the right people around you. You have the right opportunity. And you have the right profession. And I think they need you to be great, those you're fighting for. They will dance after cancer because of you. They will play violins again. They will walk and run. You are everything to those people. You give life. Please do not ever settle for I'm comfortable having a job. I'm comfortable passing a class. I'm comfortable. The stakes are too high. Set your goal, raise the bar, bet on leadership, create alignment, act as one, win the hearts of the people around you, and excel at what you do. And if you will, the world's going to be a better place because of this organization. Thank you for your time. Randy, thank you so much. Um, thank you for reminding us of what's important. Um, that was wonderful, really wonderful. I invite you now all to join us in the exhibit hall to reconnect with friends and colleagues while checking out the newest products and services from our, our exhibitors. Thank you so much.